what i think we're live i think we're good <laughs> hello chat room how's it going um if you are just joining please make sure that you set your chat settings to everyone and not just hosts and panelists otherwise you can't see each other's chat messages and that would be okay. rubbish Okay, I'm just going to wait and see if you are joining live, it'd be good to just get a quick check in the chat room, just say hi, maybe tell me if you, um, where you're joining from, hello, oh, that's a Korean screen name there, Annyeong Haseo, hello, ciao to Sicily, bonjour to Brussels, oh great, okay, hello, hey, super, andere Deutsche, um, ich wollte auch sagen, für andere Deutsche, for other Germans, um, happy start of carnival season. Hello, if you're a carnival celebrator. Okay, I have not got endless amounts of time. So I'm just going to get cracking with this one. I love Caroline. <laughs> Wonderful. Okay, I don't, don't think I'm necessarily going to be seeing the chat all the way through because there's a lot of you. I hope there's a lot of you, um, but uh, feel free to use the Q&A button throughout. I will check that before we have to close. And uh, I'm just going to share my screen and check with you that you can see it. But I believe we're all good. OK, so in today's talk. Checking. Is this working? Can you see my slides? Are you having a good time? This is great if you feel like a rock star doing this. Okay, um, so I'll, my name is Kirsten and I'm going to be talking to you about improving your vocab memory. If you're seeing me in the little screen, I will be looking to my right quite a lot because that's where I can see my slides. And I thought I'll introduce myself. I'm new to a lot of you and I am not a classic sort of MFL teacher. I'm a little bit outside the system started as an independent German tutor a decade ago and um, I do have a, a background of always loving languages, always studying languages, adding a lot of languages as well um, and I became more and more interested in how people stand in their own way, how they trip themselves up so um, developed my practice a little bit more as a coach for independent language learners so that's how I refer to myself now and in this I've I'm quite entrepreneurial online, so I have made a lot of language online courses, both in language and in language learning skills. I hosted a podcast for a long time, and uh, you could get the link there if you want to check out my podcast archive. You're so welcome to it. It's called it's fluent dot show. Really, really easy. Um, I've hosted language learning retreats as well, sort of taken groups of students to Germany to give them an immersive practice and written hundreds of blog articles. So I've thought about this a lot. Um, and vocab, I know, is a topic that, um, ups that upsets the apple cart for a lot of people. Like, we think you're forgetful. Okay. If you want to um, go with the accompanying guide that I have made that goes with this session, so it's just a, a way to take your notes and to make sure you've captured everything, you don't really have to take notes then, uh, you can go to fluentlanguage.co.uk, that's my website, slash language show, uh, sign up there and you will get access to the PDF, how to improve your vocab memory. So it, it's a companion piece for this talk. Now. Quick one, <laughs> this is almost like the dictionary definition, but I wanted to cover what is vocab just to give you a sense of how I think about it for the purpose of this talk. So your vocabulary, we're, we're all foreign language people, right? So you're thinking of vocab, okay, as like instantly, these are all the words I've got to memorize, but vocab is most most importantly a set of the familiar words in your language so the words that are familiar to you basically the words that you know um, and then there is a difference between sort of words that you passively know you recognize what that is but you wouldn't really say it um, and then the words that we have in our active vocabulary so there there are certain words like say immersion that I'm going to be much more likely to use than whoever lives next door because they're not 
in this language learning space. And it's the same for you. So everybody's got a, an individual vocabulary, even in our native languages. Um, my native language is German. And there are words that I don't have that I have in English. Um, all the adult ones, mortgage, DIY. I always have to think about those. Uh, your vocab usually increases with age. So the older you get, and this, hap this continues throughout your life as you have different experiences, uh, you just know more words. And uh, the point of vocab, obviously, is to support communication, but also to support your learning, right? Learning any kind of skill, learning different skills. So, for example, I have learned a lot about uh, sourdough baking <laughs> since the pandemic. And there are words that I know now in English, such as... Um, Oh gosh, <laughs> it's, it's 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 gone out of my head. But when you mix the flour and the water at the start, um, and words such as raising time, improving time, and um, a Dutch oven, etc., there are so many words that that I use and know now. Not the starter, Maria. I'm, I'm gonna. It'll come to me in twenty slides, and then I'll suddenly blurt it out. Um, but these words are so useful for me for supporting my own learning of a new process. So vocab is, is it's essential for communication. Um, and even you can think about the concept in, in all human communication, in all human languages, including um, certain, say non-spoken variants of language, so if you're thinking sign language, et cetera. Okay, I've got a quote here that I really love, and I'd love, I, I can actually see the chat room, so this is good. Um, Tell me whether you agree with this, whether you feel this in your heart. I love this one. Without grammar, very, very little can be conveyed. Without vocabulary, nothing can be conveyed. <laughs> right? Without vocabulary, we're kind of lost. We do really need to do this, right? So yes, lots. I see a lot of people agreeing with this one. And if you're thinking about a vocab routine in the sense of, your study system that you have going on is good. It's really good, especially as a foreign language learner. And I work with independent learners. Right? So many people I work with do not even have the benefit of, say, benefit and limitations of the, the system, meaning um, sort of, you know, a structured curriculum, a teacher who guides them through this, um, lots and lots of this support. Um, so the vocab routine, when I think about it, I work with a lot of people who start from scratch, have to do this from zero. And it's so useful because it helps, yeah, private students. Um, it helps you understand things faster, right? The more words you know. And I, I see this every week when I'm in my Welsh class. Um, if, it's a, if it's something where I don't know the words, then I'm sat there, first of all, going through the dictionary. Um, it increases your confidence. So for a lot of learners, the more the fewer words they have to look up the better they feel and let's be straight talking here it'll improve your grades because your performance and your functionality in the language increases the more vocabulary you have under your belt and finally i think this is critical when you feel like learning a foreign language feels a little bit like the world's longest hurdle race, right? And the hurdles get a little bit lower the more vocab you know, right? The more like you have in your long-term memory, the more competent you feel, the hurdles get a little bit lower. And then at some point, it just kind of feels like you're walking, you're on a nice summer walk. But at the start, it's all hurdles. And without that, you, with, with the hurdles, the more hurdles are in the way, the less you enjoy the language, the less you actually get to, like, enjoy the context, enjoy the culture, enjoy what it gives you, and understand the people who really speak it. So vocab, in other words, critical, critical. Okay, I have in this talk three mistakes that I have observed um, that I very often see language learners make and sometimes also teachers perpetuate. Um, so here's my here's my um, stake. 
I'm now going to plant it. I hope you are all ready for that. Mistake number one, I call playing the numbers game. Playing the numbers game. And this is this is common um, in, in many, many fields. And it emerges in questions such as, um, how many words do I have to learn to get to level this or that? Or I have looked up how many words this is, and then people start to game it backwards, right? You try to engineer your success. So you're thinking something like, I'm going to learn 2,000 words because too far they're important, you know, like you need a lot of words. This is maybe a good sort of, what, A2 you're getting in there. Um, and I'm going to learn these in the next three months. How can we possibly do this? I know. It's, it's it's like, you know, you're feeling good about yourself at this point. You're like, I have set a goal. It's measurable. It's great. It, I mean, in practice, it's not measurable. You and I both know that. Feels specific, though. Feels like you've actually found something tangible in the mess that is language learning. And then you try. And then here is the thing. It, you know, you, you then go, okay, I've got 2,000 words to learn. I need, I've got, I've given myself three months to do it. So that's actually just 22 words a day. Cool, right? 22 words a day? Can I do that? I mean, maybe, maybe I can, I can look at 22 words a day. The problem when you're trying to add them up like that and you're trying to play the numbers game is you're not actually giving yourself the job of learning 22 words a day. You're giving yourself the job of learning 22 words on day one, 44 on day two, because your brain doesn't instantly save things like a computer might. And um, and then 66, the next one. And let's not even talk about day four, let alone three months worth, right? It's, it's a tough job. Even if you tried a quarter of this, which is what, six words a day, it's still too much to actually develop that active vocab it's it's still asking so much from your brain and your memory. So this numbers game thing is a really tricky way to think about this. And I often see this with, say, flashcard apps or um, certain products that talk about um, strengthening your memory as the tool to learning a language. So it talks about your memory, like this huge statistics list. And if you just kind of bring all the statistic list, bring this list into your head, then you speak the language. So then you can numberize it. It's a very, very masculine way of looking at it, I guess. So I don't know. And it's a very it, um, masculine energy. I mean, and it's wanting to control it, right? But the real test, this is from a wonderful book called Becoming Fluent. Um, written by Roger Kreutz and Richard Roberts. And Roger Kreutz is wonderful. I've had him on my podcast, I highly recommend it. He's a psychologist. And um, a quote that he gave is, the real test of how well you speak a language is how easily you communicate when you are using that language and the pleasure that you derive from speaking it. And it just makes me so happy to, to see this quote and to share it because it puts the pleasure, the joy of speaking another language right up there, right up there. If you are not, you'll notice if you're a, a teacher of students in the classroom, the ones who are having fun, they do better. I, I've, I've had this with my tutors. If they're, if they're into whatever they're, they're doing, they show up, they actually do their homework. It's magic. So the pleasure you derive from speaking the language is important because it it increases your increases your performance improves your performance um but also measuring how well you communicate is a much better measurement measurement than how many words do you know so that's the numbers game let's say we're done with that one um and talk about mistake number two which is maybe more common in independent learners i don't know it's people think people waiting for perfection, right? For, for the 100% score, for the A star, before you can have fun. And yes, I'm talking about fun again. Because we know, hey, Janet, okay, we know fun is super important, right? So applying what you're learning 
there's so much that you can do way before you are in any way, just checking my time, you are in any way perfect. If if I waited, <laughs> if I waited until I was perfect at anything in Welsh, I swear to God, I would not have had the experiences that I've had. So to me, applied learning can look like lots and lots of different things. Applied learning can look like making mistakes when you are speaking and when those mistakes are corrected, pointed out to you, when you realize you've made a mistake, not, not re re recoiling from them, but embracing them and saying, oh, this is, I'm such an amateur. <laughs> it's, it's literally, um, uh, sit between Chad come right. <laughs> so got a few Welsh speakers in the, um, in the chat. Uh, it is, the attitude that really, really matters. And if you can take it in your stride, and I think as teachers, tutors, um, we can do a lot here. Um, like there is, there are German pronunciation mistakes that will never stop making me laugh. Uh, Schießen, if, you, if you're a German speaker, you know what I'm talking about. It's it's such a, you know, to to be inclusive with the student, to to get the giggles, but then let them in on what you're getting the giggles for and allowing for things to be funny is so powerful in this field and i think especially in in the in the environments where in language learning performance is so valued and so you know we all always think about how we're going to measure skill how do we measure performance and people get really scared of making mistakes so you could set out to make mistakes my friend lindsay who's also um, a language tutor and coach she has talked about mistake goals. Just set yourself the goal of making five mistakes a day. Go for it. And I think just when the mistake comes, see the funny side. See the funny side. Accept that whatever language you're learning is probably weird because that's that's why you're doing it. Because we're we're here we're here to expand our horizons. Um, it can also look like um, hey Lindsay. <laughs> uh, it can also look like maybe listening to some new songs. Um, maybe watching TV in your target language. I've just started watching Gogglebox in Welsh. It's it's brilliant, um, and I still put the I still put the subtitles on. Um, or maybe you cook from a new recipe. Right, have a look around, and that is applied learning. Maybe trying to work out the instructions. Maybe look up different words. Just whatever it is that you enjoy, it, anything can be. You can apply your language to it. And finally, something I like to do with new words, especially in languages that I know well, where the new words are perhaps a bit quirky or things I didn't know, or I want to see usage examples, is to look them up, either type them into Twitter, if anyone's still using Twitter after this week, um, or um, putting them in something like Google News, you know, putting them into um real practice examples and you can set google news to show you the results in the target language um so these are really really cool there's also a website called lingui langue l-i-n-g-u-e-e dot com which for professional language context is quite good at showing you lots of languages in um in context and language usage in context so again you know just finding more examples of how those words are used that you're learning, how those expressions are used, that's applying what you're learning. Mistake number three. Ooh, I promise this is the last one. I get so much, so much. Um, I, I witness so much misery in people who, who, who really worry, who really feel upset that they are ever so uh, forgetful, you know? And th there's a certain age element that people bring into it as well, because we know that memory can be a bit fady after a certain age. And um, and it's, <laughs> it's, a, it's a tricky situation um, because people then draw from that the conclusion that it, just because they've forgotten a word that must mean they are very very forgetful um, and they don't have the skills that they need they don't have the skills that they require in order to learn a language well and obviously that's not a thing right we could look at that differently 
and a lot of what we a lot of what we can do um and when it comes to language learning and changing perceptions mindset thinking around it um if you're thinking you all probably know the growth mindset etc a lot of it is about perspectives and just asking how can i think about this differently so i'm i've i've brought up the forgetting curve um the forgetting curve is it's as close scientifically i believe as um we can come to some kind of illustration of how memory long term memory might work um, and it is the basis upon which lots and lots of um, algorithmic flashcard apps and all that kind of stuff are based. Um, I always say, like, remember that spaced repetition, um, it's also just life, <laughs> you know, it's what life does to you. Um, and this shows, one something that this illustrates quite well, is that you, you're definitely going to forget. <laughs> like, you're definitely going to forget what I've just told you. Uh, it's really interesting to, to look at uh, reports or studies of uh, recall in people who say were witnesses to an accident um, and how in inaccurate your recall of any kind of event or not even an intensive event any event say this event you don't know what I said 10 minutes ago etc um, how vague our recall in anything is right the memory just remembers the absolute things that it thinks I really need this for survival otherwise no <laughs> so if you have something and you encounter it, say a new word, uh, you, you encounter it on day one, and then you don't really see it again, you, in any target language, you're going to forget it. If that word then comes at you on day one and day two, chances, we can see this, this line here, I mean, memory, <laughs> it's a, not, not a scientific measurement, but still, chances are that it's going to stick a little bit better. If you encounter that word again on day one, day two, and day three, chances are it's going to stick a little bit better. If you encounter it again on day four, chances are it's going to stick a little bit better. What is even better, better, <laughs> is if there are a few breaks in between, because it allows you to, it allows you to, well, first of all, take a few other words in as well. Um, but also if there are a few breaks in between, you're not actually going to lose a lot right because you've still got see here you've still got a little bit of this on day two you don't really need it again on day two but you might need it again on day three and then these curves sort of converge scientist kirsten um back in the box i'm gonna take off my lab coat um but something th that i have used <laughs> and this is okay so I've seen somebody else put this in different words on Twitter. So how I usually put it with my, my students and my coaching clients is I'll say, if it's important, it'll come back, right? Don't worry too much about forgetting every single word. Don't worry too much about every single word that your language tutor just gave you like a massive list of, because if they're important, they're going to come back anyway. And then you'll realize you'll have forgotten it, but you'll have to look it up again. And if you do that enough times, like life will make you repeat the words that you need if you expose yourself to your target language enough uh, because if the words are important they're going to come back anyway again if you are learning and studying towards a test i know a lot of us are working in institutional circumstances different story uh, <laughs> um, but this is really critical if it's important it's going to come back anyway um, so we can all chill out a little bit about memory and the other way to put it that I've seen this week or last week was somebody saying, well, uh, I'm not really too worried about um, the words in a language that I've forgotten. It's not like I'm never going to see them again. <laughs> and I love that. It's like, it's not like I'm never going to see them again. It is so true. It's so true. You know, like, don't make it a big crump to learn. Don't make it something to freak out about. It's not like you're never going to see the word again. It'll come back anyway. Now, if I was to put language learning into um, a system or systemize it or think about it in some kind of organized way, there's my mask, um, there are three steps. So if you're ready, <laughs> ready to hear my three steps, how I think about vocab learning, I would break it down into 
growing your vocabulary, memorizing, not necessarily at the same time as growing, and then the reviews. The review meaning that's when you see them again. The grow stage is where we need to be organized. We need to be a little systematic about capturing all the different words that come to us, come at us from different sources. So it might be a textbook. Um, here I've got a chat screenshot of a, a tutoring session on Skype um, where tutors will just, they, they type all the words that they're you know, explaining to you that you don't know. You end up with a massive list. Um, it might be a classroom session, of course. It might be your old language learning app, whatever it is. All these words come at you from different places. And I'm a big advocate of having one location to to capture them if you will capture them like i said you don't have to but if you want to be systematic and take control of your learning i do think especially at the start of learning a new language huge huge All right so i i'm a pen and paper kind of girl so i will handwrite most of the vocab that i really want to remember and i know when i reach levels say B1, B2, where I'm functional, I write a lot fewer vocab lists because that's when I can rely on my foundations more. But especially at the start, I handwrite them, but I also have this sort of app icon here to illustrate that there are really good um, flashcard apps. So I jumped ahead a bit then. Now let's talk about memorizing. There, there's lots and lots of different ways to memorize. And I wouldn't, so mem by memorizing, I mean actively um, taking some actions to help your brain remember the words better, to, to support your memory. There are more than these options available that I've got on the screen here, but these are some good ones. And I would only recommend them for words you really know already are going to be important to you. Say, if you're planning your wedding in Spain and you really want to word, learn the word for wedding, what do you call them, invigilators? Or you really want to learn the word for bridal bouquet? Right? That might be something you really don't want to forget. So it might be worth putting in the little effort to memorize it. Um, you could use mnemonics for that. I think mnemonics are really, really brilliant. So this is something like that word sounds a bit like this. Um, that word reminds me a little bit like this. The app Memrise has got a sort of database of base of mnemonics and allows people to share how they remember words. I found that really useful. So for example, the um, I use the Welsh word coeno, coeno as a as an example. It's about it means complaining. It sounds a bit like queen. So the image I had, I kind of associated with it in my head is the the, the queen, a, a grumpy picture of the queen, Queen Elizabeth, rest in peace. Um, there's there's lots of pictures of her looking sort of you know a little bit grumpy. <laughs> so if you memorize that and you think coeno, the the queen is complaining. Um, and the meaning of the word is complain, it, it then helps you put all that together. Um, and for a lot of people, that is enough richness to make it stick. Um, the second one is mental context. Um, the app I mentioned is Memrise, M-E-M-R-I-S-E. -E. There you go. Chat room, you've, you've got yourselves covered. Um, mental context. Um, so that is similar to, like I said earlier, searching for it in, for example, Google News. So if you had a, a Spanish word, uh, let's use the Spanish word despacito. <laughs> so if you have the word despacito, of course, you know a mental context for that, right? You have the song despacito. Um, and I don't know about you, but um, I certainly learned a few Spanish words with the Macarena back in the day. Um, and uh, so songs can be huge for this, but also you might you might have the word Despacito, imagine there wasn't a song. So you could go to, I think it's news.google and then you put dot the country extension. So news.google.es um, and you type Despacito in there and just see what's out there. Maybe type it into YouTube, see what happens um, and then kind of get a sense of how that, again, how that word is used, how it exists in the world, how Spanish speakers use it. Um, and then the last thing is uh, touch points, touch points. Yeah, I mean, we could recommend apps till the cows come home. It's so good. There's so much out there now. Um, touch points. And by that, I mean, um, I often do this physically. 
So if I really want to remember a word, my best friend, I don't know if you can see this, is this. It's a stack of post-its and I'm going to stick it on a post-it. Um, and the same way I, I make myself remember a lot of things in my life. Um, and I will put the post-it on somewhere I'm going to see it again or somewhere related to the word I'm learning. So, for example, the words for um, light and dark for a long time, I had them on my computer screen. Not obscuring the screen, but sort of, you know, on my laptop um, because it reminded me of, OK, if you turn your screen brighter and darker. So I had a little bit of context, but I also had these touch points where every time I went to the computer, I saw the words again. It's again, this is about deliberately making that effort to see them again. And finally, there's the review stage. And reviewing to me is mostly about applying what you're learning. You know, like using what you are learning. Um, I've got the I've got the paper-based system here again. So I will, if I really want to kind of take control of my learning, I'll do the really old school thing of obscuring one side of my vocab list and going through it. Reviewing works obviously really well with flashcard apps and with any kind of vocab learning apps. But I also wouldn't underestimate the power of, number one, using your words, maybe writing around them, using them as writing prompts, looking up things like um, words, that, words that they rhyme with, maybe playing, playing some games with them, and um, using other people and having the, having the conversation with other people. Um, so using a word in conversation and deliberately going out of your way to use a word in class with a tutor is super, super powerful. I really want to leave you with this one sentence. The best way to review words is to use them. So actually use them in a sentence, maybe write some texts <laughs> to somebody you're talking to um, and see that you can actually create with them. We know if you're thinking Bloom's taxonomy, you you ultimately want to build them into your own vocabulary so that you can start using them. Um, and I think of using as a, a 360 kind of the holistic point of view. And I know a lot of you will be familiar with the, um, the common European framework um, where we're thinking about listening, reading, speaking and writing. I'm like a broken record. I bang on about listening, reading, speaking and writing with a lot of my people because what people really want to do when they're learning a foreign language, especially independently, is speak. Right. You want to speak the language. So obviously, in order to speak, you need to practice speaking. But what a lot of people might do when they just practice a language is put a lot of emphasis on, oh, I watch so much YouTube um, or things that are much more, you know, like input based and um, consumptive. Is that a word? <laughs> in my vocabulary now um, rather than kind of going about production and if I ask people um, ask people to think about their language learning routine in terms of these four different aspects um, and ask people to make sure that they practice each each one of the four different core skills and maybe use one resource say you are looking up that google news article so we we the German speakers used, we mentioned carnival before. Say you want to learn about German carnival, have a little Google around for it. And then can you, how can you put it into your speaking? How can you talk to somebody about this? What can you, can you get it into your listening somehow? Is there something on um, Deutsche Welle, dw.de about carnival? Where can you read about it? How can you maybe write some sentences around it? So we really want the, we want to try and get usage out of your resource um, with the four core skills. And if you're consistent in that, your actual need for vocab and grammar, also memorization and this sort of rote learning and, and regurgitating of um, verb endings, like the way I did at school, um, it becomes a lot less relevant. And most people don't like that kind of stuff. And most people think language learning is just about that. So we are here, I think, as ambassadors to model other fun ways of doing it. Oh, here is my husband. My printer didn't work. I've never printed this off. Luckily, you can see that. Um, I do apologize. I hope he doesn't text more random stuff. <laughs> okay.
So this is just a reminder of where you can find the uh, language show little guide. So it goes together with what I've put out here. I've put it um, together with what I've put into this talk. Um, and it's just a sort of a mixture between an ed memoir and somewhere that you can take notes and a little note on maybe where you can find me again. <laughs> so um, so it's uh, fluentlanguage.co.uk slash the language show. Um, and I just wanted to recommend that one to you again. Now, let me come off of screen sharing. I think I've made good time. I say this knowing that I'm not entirely sure how much time I actually have. So let's have a little chat. Let's go to the Q&A. Oh, thank you so much. Hey, thank you. And I'm glad you enjoyed the talk. Those of you who enjoyed the talk. <laughs> if you didn't enjoy it, I'm glad you're not telling me about it. Okay, so I have one question. Please use the Q&A button um, if, you, if you want. Okay, Stan says, I enjoy reading Spanish. If I click answer live, maybe you can see the question. I don't know. I enjoy reading Spanish, a language I am learning. When it comes to remembering new vocab that I have highlighted in Kindle, it's difficult to remember it when speaking. Why? Um, that is, a lot of that is, um, a lot of that is related to this idea of the uh, passive and active vocab. So you, um, when when we are doing language acquisition, when we learn a language, uh, it's it's kind of like when you're learning your own language, right? Recognizing a word, uh, recognizing a word, and just kind of perceiving it is easier than to use it when speaking. And also speaking. Speaking is super tough. I think it's cognitively the most demanding process, meaning you really need your um, <laughs> your brain is doing like extra, extra, extra work. Um, so you need to be very, very fast, especially in conversation. You're trying to understand what the other person is saying. You're doing the accent thing. You're decoding what they're saying. Then you're trying to work out what your answer is. You're trying to reply. So everything happens all at once. So a really cool way of um, practicing that the speaking thing I think might be self-talk so if you've got your words um, write yourself some sentences um, that using the words that you've seen in the kindle book and actually say them out loud and I like the idea of um, self-podcasting I call it so recording it and uh, putting it on your phone and playing it back to yourself so you hear your own voice saying it um, and then repeating yourself repeating yourself so the more that you actually use the words when you're speaking even if no one's listening, the easier it'll be to then use them in your speech consistently. Um, I hope that helped. Yeah, I'm loving how many languages we have in the chat. And oh, um, Jen Hapisiani Welder, Clara Honachi, comment your and a gumrike, Suluadi and a gumrike. Okay, um, this question is a little bit trickier. Um, any suggestions, please, for German vocab learning? Uh, thank you for the question is not very specific. So in addition to all the tips I've already given you, which are useful for learning any language, um, I can't, I don't know what exactly, if you could specify the question, that would be really, really good. Okay, Samantha says, hello. <laughs> and Salive, do you have any suggestions for motivating teenage learners to take this kind of ownership of their learning? The internet, <laughs> it's, this is really tricky. This is really tricky. It's an interesting question because I think back to how I was a language learner and I don't think I thought about my language learning very methodically, but looking back, a lot of the things I did were super good practice uh, kind of stuff. So I think the with teenagers especially, the more you can get them to find and relate to something that they're, that they can that that relates to something that they're sort of a bit obsessive about um the better so it's all about kind of finding something that you're into and giving you a reason um and i i have this i don't know if you've if anyone in this chat room is a fan of the smiths but if you know the song panic by the smiths sometimes i mention this um in panic he has um that the lyric goes hang the dj because the music that they constantly play says nothing to me about my life and I love that. I think about that, for example, when I'm creating content, um, used to think about it a lot when podcasting, but I think for language learners, it's also relevant. It's got to 
say something to you about your life. So the more that we can think about, even if you can just have a conversation or have try and get them to list relevant vocab, relevant to something that is something that they're actually going through or something that they're into or something that they're watching on TV, even if it's in English, um, you can still talk about it in the target language. Um, and I see the chat room mentioned games. Games never gets old. Everybody loves a bit of taboo in a foreign language, right? Um, so I hope this helps. So this is about the, the relevance and the emotional resonance. Um, I know my husband, like he grew up in Blackpool and we've had conversations about um, him and his language learning in school. And he said, well, I didn't think I'd ever leave the country. Maybe if I, you know, he, he did he did way better at learning German uh, when he actually had a German girlfriend, <laughs> of course. So again, it's got to say something to you about your life. Um, okay, why now? Have I got have I got three minutes? Is that correct? Does anyone know the end time of this? Um, comment. My husband has uh, stopped adding more German, but hey. Um, why are some words harder to remember than others? It's insane to me that I remember most words just fine after using them once or twice, but certain ones just won't go in. Any thoughts on how to fix this? I know the feeling. I cannot tell you why. Ends 12.15, okay. I might not get through all the questions, but feel free to um, direct message me afterwards. And I'm very, very grateful to you. Um, I have got a little... Um, I've got a book on Kindle. If you want to find it, it's it's under my unmarried name. It's it's this. I can't type into the chat. It's Kirsten, and then my last name is H A W M E S. Uh, you can also message me, or if you've signed up for the um, language fluentlanguage.co.uk slash language show, then uh, you will see more things that I do anyway and links, etc. Okay, so on this, uh, forgetting words, I think this is where. It is really where the mnemonics and all those memorization techniques that I mentioned come into their own. You have two choices at that point. You can either take the route of saying, not like I'm never going to see it again, unless I, unless I genuinely won't and then I'll forget it and just like take the path of acceptance, I guess. Or you can take control um, and go about memorizing words and that's where my example with quino the quino the the welsh word comes in um it's it's then a little bit more about taking control and doing all those active memorization technique things that can really really help so it's sort of i think the frustration the why unclear it's different for different people as well um but i certainly have lots of words that just just don't go in because sing them to yourself uh, you can stick them all over. Like I used to, everything I had to memorize, I used to stick it up on the mirror in my bathroom. So just when you're brushing your teeth, you're just staring at it. Um, and then eventually, it's kind of a faith thing. Eventually, you you go in. Um, and I mean, the examples that David has given there in reply, brackish, you don't say that every day, right? So again, it's that memory curve thing. If it doesn't keep, if you don't keep funneling it in at the top, it's easier to forget. Okay. Dina says, sorry, I'm chatty as well. What do you think about typing versus handwriting while studying? I Okay, so when you're taking notes, there has been some research that seems to indicate that it aids re remembering what you've actually taken in. Um, and, and that is handwriting. Um, when you are, generally, handwriting is slower. So a lot of people kind of put it down to that and it's a little bit more cumbersome um, and there's a sort of hand brain connection that is a little bit stronger. Um, but I don't think, as far as I'm aware, correct me if I'm wrong, there has been like anything super conclusive um, in the research that says like, no, we definitely need to go with handwriting. The advantage of typing your notes might be that it's much, much easier to have um, mobile access to them, to be able to refer back to them. Um, and you, they look more organized and you'll be able to actually use them more. Um, whereas if you're just scribbling things left, right and center, that could end in chaos. Okay, I'll, I'll take maybe one more. I've, 
I can just keep going until I'm thrown out. That's also fine. <laughs> um, Connor says, do you personally find it easier when making vocab lists to break them down into specific groups, for example, vocab of food, or do you find it better to just have one vocab list for the language Spanish vocab list? I like working with topical vocab. I think it sort of happens naturally because when you are thinking about something specific, so you, you think, say you're doing a word cloud or something like that, or a, a, a brainstormy type thing, um, I think it's it can make it easier and it it accesses creative parts of your your brain and your thinking that I think are highly beneficial. However, when I am making my own vocab lists in reality. I I just write down whatever comes in and then I maybe look back at it later and I go which ones are actually important and I want to remember them and I would be far too lazy to put them all into topical clusters so in that sense I think topical clusters can be useful but whether you have to make them for yourself it's more about staying organized and confident rather than your your personal I don't think there is any enormous benefit. So it's whether you want to make the effort. Okay. Martin, as you're multilingual, like me, high five, do you work more on your lesser languages or do you try to devote the same amount of time in all your languages? Maybe not so much for Deutsch and English. Yeah, I don't think about Deutsch and English, really. Um, my main language is, is Welsh. I think about my goals. I think about my goals. I think about which languages do I want to make progress in? In which languages am I okay with a good chunk of attrition? In which languages um, sometimes I will, I will, which languages are new and exciting to me? What do I want to do in them? I think of languages as a hobby, not some kind of performance sport for myself. Um, so for me, um, my lower level languages mostly I don't do much with um Welsh however used to be a lower level language and now it's sort of edging into she can actually do stuff um so I go with which one am I excited about and which one do I want to be um good at, good at really um so this is it's it's more about goals rather than like for me personally um, and then if I've got reason to really cram something in and, and get better at something quickly, like I'm doing a podcast interview in French on Monday. So this weekend, you bet I'm going to revise some French. Okay. I'm so overrunning. Um, I'll do the last question. Um, how can we help students understand what words they actually need? They very often think they need every word. I teach in the medical sector, all the doctors and surgeons have huge pride. It's such an issue, right? This sort of self-compassion in, in language learning and understanding that the 100% recall performance doesn't necessarily relate to, relate to being good at using a language um, is, is a big thing. So it, it depends. If they feel like, in the sector that they're in, in the kind of conversations that they're planning to have, medical sector in Swedish, um, there is a certain level of words that they really need to memorize and, and actively own. Um, I would go with that, right? And I would uh, encourage them to come up with their own lists, right? And then encourage them also to limit their lists, to really think about what is needed, think creatively and make it say something like, okay, so you're going to come to me with 15 words. Let's have a look at like, what are your 15 that you really must and then help them understand what an achievement it is to know those 15 and then add so that you kind of you try. I wouldn't necessarily prescribe words because it's difficult to know exactly what's in their heads, um, but see if you can maybe pace them along. Um, that might work. <laughs> okay. Um, I have, like I said, massively overrun. Thank you so much. It's fluentlanguage.co.uk is the place where you can find out more about me. I am going to be hanging around in the 
live chat, etc. Thank you so much for attending. I love presenting live. I love presenting live at the language show. The Okumbao, I have it. Vielen, vielen Dank. Bye. Let's see if I can find a button to end this session <laughs> and enjoy the rest of the show. <laughs> Ciao. Cool, bye.